<coughs> as long as you're doing it, you're doing it. And you're doing it um, as best as possible. And at the same time, the Seder in Hebrew comes from the, the, uh, the Seder comes from the word Seder, which means order. That there is an order to running, to the running of the Seder. There is a process of how the Seder is done. So it's important to remember that and to keep that in mind as you um, as you're doing the seder, and and each thing has its uh, its meaning and purpose behind it. Um, okay. Yeah. So 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 one additional thought that I had put here is. God understands what we have in our heart, what our intentions are, and what's, what, we're, what we're interested in, what we're looking to do. Um, and his interest is in us having a relationship with him. So as we invest in this relationship with him, by doing things like the Seder, um, <coughs> as we invest in, the, in this relationship, we're able to, uh, to strengthen that connection and really uh, continue to invest um, in, in, in our relationship with God. Now we'll start talking about the Seder itself. So the three main things that, uh, that take place on this. So any questions before I continue? All right. The, the three main things that take place at the Seder uh, or that we need for the Seder is we need wine, we need matzah, and we need a Seder plate. Wine, we all know we drink the four cups of wine. Matzah is the four cups of wine, and the Seder plate um, I'll go through in a minute. For the, um, for the matzah, there's different types of matzahs uh, that you could buy in the supermarket. Um, there's matzah, uh, matzah shmura, which is a matzah which was guarded from the, from the time of the wheat being grown. Um, just a side note, a very interesting story. Um, there was a kibbutz in Israel, which... Uh, which grew wheat for, um, for matzah. And um, it, wasn't a it, it wasn't a religious kibbutz, it was a, just a, a kibbutz that grew wheat, not for matzah. There was another kibbutz that grew wheat for matzah, and what happened was so something happened and their, their, their crops got all destroyed. This is a true story. And um, <clears throat> knowing that, the, that, the, uh, that this is the guy's livelihood, he decided he was going to find another field and buy the wheat off of that person so that he could have the wheat for the matzah. Uh, he went, he tracked down, the, uh, tracked down a field um, near the border, um, one of the borders of Israel and I think it was Gaza. And, um, and he asked the guy if he can buy his wheat. And the guy said, it's not, it didn't even grow yet, you know, let alone, you know, he says, I want to cut it down when it's green, when it's not ready. I want to buy it right now as is. And he went ahead and, and this guy was like, great, I got my whole year's um, income straight off of a field which wasn't even ready. Um, the guy cuts it down and done. Two days later, and I can send you guys the video of this just because uh, so to, to reassure you, two days later, there was a terrorist attack where the guys came out through the field and they had scouted it out and assumed that this field is gonna be covered in wheat. And when they when they when they when the terrorists popped out through the through this hole, they saw suddenly it's it's an empty field, and and the uh, the IDF was able to immediately target them so that they were not able to infiltrate into Israel. Um, and so it was interesting, you know, the story is a very interesting story to see how you know Hashem God you know keeps his uh, his eyes on the uh, on the Jewish people all the time and you know keeps people safe. Um, and if you remind me after the class, I'll I'll send it out. Um, all right, so there's the, the matzah, the wine, and the um, Seder plate. The basics of the matzah, let's talk about that. The reason why the Jewish people had the matzah is because when they were in Egypt, they were having the Pesach offering on the night before, and before they left in the morning, you know, the plan was to leave, they, they put together their dough and their, um, their, um, their flour and their water, and they were getting ready to bake <laughs> bread for the, for the trip. And uh, Moshe came and said, guys, we don't have time. We don't have time to take a, um, a, you know, a doggy bag for the road. Just go. And, uh, and so they took their unleavened bread. They took their, their, um, their, their, uh, their dough, basically, put it on their backs, and out of Egypt they went. When they got to their first stop, 
it didn't have a chance to rise and uh, it was sitting baking in the sun on their backs and so they baked the they baked the, the these cakes and they and from there is where we got matzah <coughs> so for that reason we have matzah which is as minimal as possible flour and water and whatever minimal stuff uh, is needed and from there we get the matzah um, okay um, what did I leave out over there yeah so that's that's the basics of matzah the basics of the wine um, the wine is okay wine is used every Shabbat and every holiday and every spe special occasion at a wedding or whatever it might be in order to sanctify and in order to recognize the awesomeness of the day that we're that we're entering so as as Shabbat comes in we make the Kiddush over the wine in order to recognize the awesomeness of Shabbat at a wedding when uh, when a couple is getting married you make a blessing over a cup of wine again to recognize the 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 sanctity of this union that is going on Pesach is no different um, aside for the fact that on Pesach we have four cups of wine the the four cups of wine um, one second uh, the four cups of wine uh, are four different opportunities that we're recognizing the sanctity of uh, Pesach. Um, there's different explanations on why four. Um, one says that it's uh, the first cup of wine is to recognize Pesach. The second cup of wine is to recognize the story of the Haggadah. The third cup of wine is to recognize the, uh, when we're doing the after blessing. And the fourth cup of wine is, to, is when we say the Hallel, when we say the praises. Uh, another explanation is that the four cups of wine are uh, symbolic of the four different terminologies of redemption. Um, that he took us out, that he saved us, that he redeemed us, and, and he saved us. So those four terminologies which are used in the uh, Torah portion where it talks about the going out of Egypt, um, those are the, uh, are, are, again, are the commemoration of the four cups of wine. Um, another interesting thing about the wine and the, and the matzah is that wine is very tasty. People enjoy wine. People enjoy drinking. It gives you a little buzz. It gives you, it, it gives you a, a pick me up. It's <coughs> uh, not really tasty. If you're having pure matzah, it's, it's pretty bland. I, I actually called somebody this week and I said, um, Hey, I'm in the area. I want to drop off shmura matzah. And she says to me, I hope you won't be offended, but I really think it tastes disgusting. And, and, and I wasn't offended because it's not me making it. And I get what she's talking about because she's used to egg matzo with salt and all these other you know, additives to it. But matzo in its purest sense is not a very tasty food. It's known as, uh, and it's, it's called lechem oni, poor man's bread. And, and, the, and the, so you have these two different approaches. You have the poor man's bread together with this, wine which is representative of, of I, I don't want to say physical wealth but it's wealth it's 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 luxury and the idea of the of the of the matzah and the wine together is to is to tell us that judaism requires both judaism requires our approach of one of joy and one of luxury and judaism has meaning and purpose and and a lot of wonderful things but judaism also requires the core basic of faith, the basic, uh, the, the basic purity of flour and water. I'm very simple. I am nothing in the, in the image of God. So on the one hand, I am everything. I am totally related. But at the same time, I have a humility and a purity of, of who I am um, <clears throat> um, in regards to God. So, so the, the, the matzah and the wine represent the, um, those two things. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the Seder plate itself. Um, there's a couple things that, that are consistent ac across everybody, you know, all everywhere in Judaism, it's all the same. And then there's some slight variations within it, how different communities have um, evolved. Well, you know, one of the slight variations, which is not so slight, um, 
is if you're from a Spartic background, this is not to do with the, the Seder plate, this has to do with Pesach as a whole. If you're from a Spartic background, beans and rice are, are okay on Pesach. Um, if you're from an Ashkenazic background, they don't eat beans and rice on Pesach. So, you know, I was always trying to, you know, look into my lineage to see maybe there's some Spartic in there because you have a, quite, a, quite a, for, a few more food options on Pesach if you're from a Spartic background. But, um, but, but in, in regards to the Seder plate, there's pretty much the same traditions and slight variations within the specifics of the um, food. So, um, by the way, if, um, if anybody wants, I emailed out uh, yesterday, and I, I wasn't sure exactly how I can do this here. There's a, in a, there's a printout of some of the stuff that I'm talking about um, that you can, <coughs> you can download from that email. Um, it also has a diagram of the Seder plate. Maybe I could actually, hold on one second. I think I could pull it up here. Um, give me one second. Now, did you anticipate that you would be explaining what the Seder was? Yeah, my computer is going a little slow here. So if it pops up in a moment, it'll work. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'll, I'll try it again in a moment, but for now, um, for now I'm on this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the Seder plate is, maybe I can, So the Seder plate looks something, something like that, um, something like that. You have the zroa, the shank bone, the, mor the egg, the beta, moror, haroset, karpas, and chazeret. If you're from the, some people have the a second moror, and we'll talk about that. So starting with the top right and left of, so the top two of the Seder plate. It is customary to have two cooked foods on the Seder plate. The, the two cooked foods are to commemorate two of the offerings that were brought on Passover in the temple, into the, in the Beit HaMikdash. Um, and the first one was the Karban Pesach, the, Pe the Pesach offering. And for that, we have um, what's, what's uh, either a shank bone, uh, some people have a little bit of chicken, some people have a piece of meat, um, but whatever it is, it's cooked. Um, and that is in the top right, of the Seder plate. Um, we do not eat that nowadays because we do not have the, pace, the ability to offer the Pesach sacrifice, but we, but we have that to commemorate the Pesach sacrifice. On the top left of the Seder plate, we have the egg. Now the egg <coughs> is interesting because it commemorates, again, another offering, the, the, the holiday offering. So there were two separate offerings. There was the Pesach offering, and then each of the holidays of the high holiday, of the three, what's called the Shalosh Regalim, which was Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot, they brought a separate um, uh, carbon, a separate, a separate offering, which was, uh, which was in honor of the holiday. So, so the egg commemorates uh, that. Now, why are we using an egg of all things to commemorate a holiday offering, which was an animal? So it doesn't, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So the, the reason for the egg is the, the egg symbolizes, the, uh, symbolizes life. When, when someone passes away, it is tradition to eat round foods, whether it be an egg, whether it be uh, lentils or different customs, uh, different round foods. And these commemorate that when someone passes away, that life doesn't end, it's a cycle, and there's new generations, um, and there's other things that, uh, that continue. The egg is, is commemorative of life, but the egg also is commemorative that, that um, <clears throat> we're, we're remembering that even though we're celebrating our freedom, our freedom is not truly complete until we're back in the, in the Beit HaMikdash, back in Israel, um, with, with, where all the Jews are back in, in, back in Israel. Um, where, does this, where else do we see this in Jewish life? When, you get, when, a, when a couple gets married, there's the concept of breaking the glass. The breaking of the glass says, even though we are at our most joyous moment, we're getting married, but we have to always remember that 
this marriage is not 100% without being back in Israel with all the Jewish people in Israel. Some people have a custom when they're painting their houses, they leave a small corner in a place where you can't see, unfinished, to remember the same concept, is that we're never completely finished. And anybody who's built a house, I've never built a house, but anybody who's built a house or done renovations, you know it never finishes anyway. Um, but, um, but again, it's to commemorate the, uh, that the Beit HaMikdash is not uh, fully complete. Um, now let's go to the middle. The middle is the marar, um, the bitter herbs. Um, the, this was a biblical commandment. The Jewish people, when they were in Egypt, already then um, had the marar and already then used the, um, uh, uh, had the marar as part of their meal in Egypt. Um, the marar, uh, where am I? The, yeah, and the marar symbolizes the, the bitter times that the Jewish people had while they were in Egypt. So you have the matzah, which is symbolic of the freedom, and you have the marar, which is symbolic of the, the pain um, uh, or the suffering that the Jewish people had um, when they were in Egypt. Um, there's different customs of what could be used for marar, um, either horseradish root um, or romaine lettuce is used oftentimes. And, a, and you know, it's not one of the questions I remember asking when I was a kid, um, was romaine lettuce isn't bitter. It's lettuce, lettuce is lettuce. I mean, if you get bad, if you get a bad one, it's, it's bad. But, it, but in general, romaine lettuce isn't particularly bitter. Um, so the, the, the reason given for that is that, um, is that, you know, if you leave the romaine growing past its, um, its perfection, it, it actually does end up tasting bitter. Um, and the same thing was, it was in a, uh, with the Jewish people when they were leaving Egypt, that they were, they were in Egypt way too long, so much so that they got bitter and they got uh, resentful um, to, to, uh, to Hashem and to others around them as well. Um, the moro happens, we have it twice on the Seder plate or depending on the custom, some people have it only once, but it's used twice during the Seder, once for the actual mitzvah of saying the uh, blessing over the moro. And the second time it's used is in the Hillel sandwich, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Now on the bottom right, we have the haroset. Um, the haroset is um, to commemorate the, the, the mortar or the bricks that the Jewish people um, had to build when they were in Egypt as well. Um, the haroset is a mixture, and, and this is where a lot of people's own customs come in. The, the, the basics of the haroset is, um, is, a, is, is um, nuts, wine, and I believe it's nuts, wine, and apples, if I'm not mistaken. But many different people have, you know, I'm, I'm looking over here, there's, there's raw fruits, nuts, spices, you know, the, it, the, the name is endless. Um, you know, what, what, what could go into it is endless. Some people, um, it's funny, when I speak to people, they say one of their favorite parts of the Seder is the haroset. That was a big part. Now, it's interesting is because the haroset is the, is the bricks, is, is, is one of the painful parts. And, and, and we're encouraged not to eat so much of it because it's, you, you don't want to be focusing on the bitter parts. You want to be focusing on the joyous parts. But, but it's fine. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, really, it's a mix of fruit, nuts, um, spices, and, and, uh, and some wine, uh, which is to, and it's supposed to kind of have a little bit of a brick, brick looking uh, color if you, can, if you can get it there. Um, and later, the maror is dipped into the haroset um, when, we're, when we're about to eat it. On the bottom left, we have what's called the karpas, which is the, um, it's the vegetable. Um, the vegetable is it really, it's, it could be, again, a, a multiple use of vegetables, celery, parsnip, radishes, cabbage, um, raw onions, a potato. Um, so really, which, whatever is, um, uh, I've seen parsley, this, and really it's whatever is the, the raw vegetable that is related to you. And that is going to be dipped in the salt water during the, um, the actual Seder. Um, okay, before I go on to the next section, anybody have any questions? Okay, if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and ask. Um, okay, the Seder, um, the, the actual Pesach actually begins at 8.05 p.m., um, there are parts of the Seder that you can do before that, but it's customary if you can 
to um, to have the um, you know uh, at least the wine and matzah after 8:05 p.m. Um, now we're going to jump into the actual seder, um, and you know there's one joke that always comes to mind, which uh, which I, I've always liked about the, about Pesach. There were two beggars sitting outside of a, a shul, and um, and they're you know they're they're looking for a for a seder. Sorry, I, I mixed it up. There was one beggar sitting outside a shul. He was a Jewish beggar. There was a non-Jewish beggar who was his friend. And um, the non-Jewish beggar says said to the Jewish one, he says, I'm starving, I need some food. He says, Pesach, the food is great. Just sit outside the shul and after, after the service, somebody will invite you to their house and you'll have a great meal. So he says, great, you know, I'm, I'm coming. So they come to shul and the, 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 the Jewish guy gets picked up and taken to one home. The, the, the non-Jewish beggar says, great, yep, you know, I'm, I'm ready to join you. He goes and joins this other family for the Seder. And he sits there and, you know, they make kiddush. He's like, great, we're starting off with wine. What could be better? And then next thing you know, they're dipping onions into uh, salt water and they're eating onions and it's, it's, it's disgusting. And then they're breaking matzah, but they're not even eating the matzah. And then they start telling this story and they go on and on and on. And finally, they, they wash their hands. They make another blessing over matzah. And he's like, I can't do this anymore. So he gets up and leaves. Um, that night, the two beggars meet at the, the you know, the corner of the, the park, and he says, uh, you know, one guy comes home, he's full, he's drunk, you know, life was great. The other guy's like, what, what kind of ridiculous Jewish customs do you have? He says, if we would have waited just two more minutes, you would have had, you would have had the meal. So, you know, it's, it's a long meal, but, but, uh, but the food is good, and, uh, you know, so we need to just bear with it, um, and, uh, and, and, and take in the, um, the beauty of the of the of what the seder has to offer. Um, so b before we make the kiddush, um, there's there's two things I would I would say that that are important to do. One is of course lighting the the candles for the holiday. Um, you know it's customary to just like on Shabbat um, on uh, on the holiday it's customary to light uh, candles for the uh, for the yom tov for the uh, for the holiday. <laughs> Another thing that's important to do is to sit down and take a moment of personal reflection and say, here I am sitting at the Seder. I'm not with tons of family this year. I'm, you know, in my case, I'm not leading a public Seder this year. It's an opportunity for each of us to take a moment and think and to process and internalize and say, here we are, we're about to go into the, um, we're about to go into the, into the Seder. We're about to experience this liberation from, from our own exiles and also to commemorate the exiles um, uh, from Egypt and to, and to say, you know what, I'm gonna give this my all and I'm gonna learn from this experience whatever I can learn from it and hopefully grow from it as a result as well. Okay, Kiddush. So the first thing that is done at the Seder is uh, you, you take a cup of wine, pretty much identical to what it is on Shabbat. Um, if anybody doesn't have a Haggadah and needs one, let me know and I'll drop one off. Um, and uh, um, everybody is, a, it's, 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 many people have different customs. The custom that I grew up with was, even though th throughout the year, the, you know, the head of the household will, will lead and make the Kiddush. Um, on Pesach, it was customary that everybody makes their own Kiddush. And the reason for that is, is that we're each going on our liberation from, uh, from, from, our, from exile to freedom. And we each want to be a part of it. Um, and we're each the leaders of our own liberation to freedom. Um, when we make, the, we make the blessing over the cup of wine, recognizing the sanctity and the holiness of the holiday. Um, and when we finish the, the blessing, it is customary to lean to the left. Um, the, the leaning up to the left is uh, symbolic of freedom. Back in the days uh, of, of, of the past, the, the aristocrats would lean on these uh, fancy, um, fancy couches when they would eat, and it's symbolic of um, freedom. And, and again, for, on Pesach, we're all free and we're all um, trying to uh, celebrate that as well. The next thing that we do is, um, is the orchat, is washing our hands. And with the coronavirus, it's the perfect time. You know, somebody sent me a, a, a little um, a joke thing. It said, um, this year it's going to go, Kadesh Orchatz, Karpas Orchatz, Yachatz um, Orchatz, Maget Orchatz. You know, because each, between each thing, we want to wash our hands and we want to be clean and we want to be, um, you know, be safe. But uh, this, this one, this washing our hands 
is not necessarily for cleanliness. This washing our hands is before we eat a, um, it's customary, uh, one of the mitzvot in Judaism, which is actually one of the, the, the less known uh, mitzvot, and I don't know the reason for it, is before we, wash, before we sit and eat, a, before we eat a wet vegetable, um, it is customary to wash our hands. I do not know the reason for that, um, why that is. But then the next thing that we do is we take the, um, the vegetable, you could take this off the Seder plate, um, or, and if you have more, than, you know, more people than the Seder plate offers, you can take from the kitchen, it's just as fine. And um, you, uh, the, you take the, the vegetable, you dip it into salt water. Um, and this uh, dipping uh, into salt water is to commemorate the tears of our, uh, of our ancestors. We say the blessing, we eat it, um, and, uh, and that is uh, part of the Seder plate. Now, why do we do something as strange as dipping a, um, a wet vegetable into salt water. The reason for that is, is, is so that the children will ask. Now, I'll explain, I'll get to the, the, the when, I, when I talk about the four questions, I'll explain what if you don't have children, why are we still asking these questions so that the children will ask and we'll talk about that uh, shortly. Um, okay. Um, Okay, you know what, I'll, I'll explain the children, why the children ask now. Um, so there are multiple things that we do on Pesach um, for the purpose of so that the children will ask. That's a, and, and that is said again and again. We say the Manashtana, the, the four questions. We do this every year. Why are we asking the same questions year after year? You know, we know the answer. When my kids come to me and they ask me the same question, I'm like, ask and answer. It's as simple as that. We've answered it already. Why are we asking it again? Why are we answering it again? We're, you know, we're, we're doing the same question again and again and again. <coughs> um, another question is, wh what if we don't have children or we don't have children at home? Why are we asking, the, you know, why are we asking the four questions? Who are we asking it to? So the simple answer to that is we're all God's children. Um, and, and, you know, here we are, we're sitting, on pay, uh, we're sitting on Pesach. Even if we don't have little children at home, we're all part of the same um, the same community, we're, we're, we're all one, and we're all here as God's children. And when we're asking the question, we're asking it as children to our, to our biological parents, but as we get older, we're asking this question to our, our spiritual parents. We're asking this to, you know, to God, and we're asking God, why have we been enslaved for all these years? Why are we doing these traditions nowadays? What is the importance? Like, Judaism's outdated. What, what, what's the point? What, Shabbat? Who cares about that? You know, um, fill in? Who cares about that? Pesach? Who cares? Why are we celebrating this? Um, and, the, and, the, and by asking, just by asking the question, we're, 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 we're setting the tone and saying, we're here. We've shown up. And then the answer, of course, needs to be answered and where we talk about we were slaves in Egypt. Um, but, but, but asking the question is a core piece of what Judaism is all about. Um, okay, continuing along with the story. So we've done the, the blessing over the cup of wine. We've washed our hands for the fruit, uh, for the vegetable. We've dipped the vegetable in salt water to commemorate the, um, the tears of the, of the Jewish people. The next thing we do, we get to is we get to the yachatz, the, the breaking of the middle matzah. Um, the, the idea of breaking the middle matzah is, um, matzah, as we said before, is considered poor man's bread. And we're breaking the middle matzah to, to be symbolic of if we haven't been poor enough as it is, we're, we're now going even to the lowest, lower, the lower level or the lowest of the lows where the Jews were when they were in Egypt. And we're going to begin our going out of Egypt from the lowest place and work out towards the highest place. Um, so that is the reason why we break the middle matzah and we put it away and again, you'll see that we have to break the middle matzah in the beginning, and we have the eating of it at the end of the Seder, which is, which is um, symbolic of we've gone from uh, slavery into freedom. Um, okay. Uh, within the story of the Haggadah, we talk about the four questions. Um, there's different customs of the order of the four questions, but the, but the same thing um, of the four questions apply. Um, why do we eat? Um, Throughout the year, we eat um, 
unleavened bread, chametz um, or matzah, and pe pesach we eat matzah. We we uh, we recline so, or we sit straight on uh, throughout the year. Um, the uh, we we dip the. Uh, why do we dip um, throughout the year? We don't even dip once. Today we're dipping twice. And the um, fourth question is, uh, and the, the, the fourth question is about the, about the mar, um, the bitter herbs. And um, we're asking these questions just for the purpose of asking. And then as far as the answer, we'll talk about that, um, which is the, the uh, where we talk about the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt and they were freed. Um, the, the story of Avadim Hayinu, um, where, we, where we begin the answer, it's customary to say that in a language that you understand. Um, that I believe that is in the handout. Let me see if I can pull up the handout now. Um, there was something wrong with my computer before. Um, but um, it is, it's customary to say that in a language. Yeah, now I'm connected. Uh, give me one second. Um, it, it's it, while, while this pulls up, it's uh, it's customary to do that in a language um, that uh, that you can understand, um, and then to ponder the question um, of being slaves in Egypt and, and ultimately getting to freedom. Um, I get up a wee now that I've done. Okay, so now I'm gonna share my screen. Um, how do I do Share screen. Okay, perfect. So now um, you can you can see the um, the bottom here. Okay, so when what I'm talking about now is the the story of the Jewish people. We were slaves to to Pharaoh in Egypt, um, and God took us out from there with a strong hand. Um, if the Holy One, blessed be, had not taken our fathers out of Egypt, then we would have uh, our children and our grandchildren would have still been slaves. Um, and if we were all wise and understanding that uh, we would still be obligated to discuss the exodus of Egypt and everyone who discusses the Egypt at length is praiseworthy. Now this, this um, section ideally should be said in, um, in, uh, in, in a language that you understand. <clears throat> um, okay, so, so and, and this is a, kind of going back to what I said before. When we're, uh, we're, the whole purpose of the Seder is to, is to not only have this freedom from our, from, from, uh, from slavery in Egypt to freedom into where we are today, but also in the freedom from the, from the things that enslave us nowadays into freedom from those, those things uh, that enslave us. So this is the opportune time to begin thinking about those struggles that we may have in our own lives and overcoming those, uh, those uh, obstacles. The next thing that's done is we talk about the, uh, the 10 plagues um, and uh, we, uh, we go through those. Uh, we, go through, we go through each of the 10 plagues um, and how, again, there's a lot of insight on how the, each of the 10 plagues had its, um, its way of tearing the Jewish people, sorry, tearing the Egyptians down from um, from their control over us, starting with the, uh, the blood in the Nile, that was their God, and God, um, and God destroyed their God by uh, making it bl blood. Uh, the frogs, the frogs brought, uh, frogs are cold-blooded animals. They're, they're, they abandon their babies when they're born. And, and again, frogs were to be symbolic of this concept that they abandoned their people and they abandoned our people. Um, and, that, and that whole, each of the, 12, uh, the 10 plagues go through that, uh, that same process. Uh, many people have the custom to sing uh, Dayenu, um, which, uh, which the concept of Dayenu is to tell us that even though we may have 
uh, gotten out of Egypt, but we never got to the Torah. Even though we got to the Torah, but we never got into the land of Israel, we're appreciative and we're grateful for each, uh, each part of, uh, of uh, Jewish life that we have. Um, we finish off the, the and, and then the Haggadah continues, and we end off the Haggadah, uh, the, the, the portion of Magid, talking about uh, co commemorating the three mitzvot of Pesach, which was the carbon Pesach, the Pesach offering, the eating of the matzah, and the moror. And we finish off the Magid with a, uh, another cup of wine, another lachaim, and uh, we get ready for the uh, matzah. Um, okay, so we've gone through the Kiddush, the washing the hands, the dipping of the salt water um, to commemorate the tears of the Jewish people, the breaking of the middle matzah to remember how, you know, the, the, low, the lowliness of the Jewish people. We've now said the, the whole story of the Haggadah. Now we're going to get into uh, the matzah. Uh, again, it's customary to wash the hands again. This time we're washing our hands again, not for cleanliness, but it is when we sit down to a meal. The meal is considered to be a holy meal, um, and the washing of our hands is, uh, you know, so much of human activity is done with our hands, and we want our hands to remain clean and pure, not only physically clean, but spiritually clean as well, um, that we're doing that to remind ourselves that we're doing this for the right purpose. So we're washing our hands to say we're about to eat the matzah, we're about to eat this meal, we want it to be um, with holy thoughts, with the, with the proper intentions. Um, we have the two matzahs. Uh, we make the blessing over the matzah, and you'll see that in your Haggadah. Um, and uh, and then, we eat the, then we eat the matzah. Uh, the next thing that we do is the maror. The, the maror is, uh, we take, like we said before, the lettuce, uh, horseradish, different uh, customs. We, uh, we dip it into the haroset. Um, we say the blessing. We do not rec recline here at the maror. Um, because it is not symbolic of freedom, it's symbolic of the slavery or the bitter times of the, of the, the Jewish people had um, while they were in Egypt. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's the, with the Mara. And again, you don't, you don't have to, some people feel this like, uh, depending on, uh, you know, we have the, some people feel like it's a big mitzvah to have as much Mara as possible. Have whatever, whatever amount you, uh, you know, you're supposed to have a, a, a small amount but enough to, um, to, to be able to taste it. Um, after the maror, we have the Hillel sandwich. Um, one, I read it when I was a kid. I read a book that said that the, the first sandwich was created by Earl of Sandwich. If I'm not mistaken, that was the, the, that was the guy's name. Um, Earl of Sandwich created the first sandwich. But according to Judaism, the first sandwich that is recorded is Hillel, um, where he made a sandwich of matzah, on the Pesach offering, and um, the the now you know one, one of the things that we always wondered was how is it possible to have matzah mar and a and a and a and basically a steak all in one? If if I try and do that, my matzah crumbles and falls apart. Um, what I was told is that the matzah in the times of the uh, in the times of the temple were more like pita pita like. They were thick matzahs. Um, they were baked within 18 minutes, but they were thick and they were more sandwich, uh, more, more, of, more like a pita than they were able to be used for a sandwich. But that was uh, a side point. And again, there's a custom to say that uh, we commemorate, this is what Hillel did, um, that he ate them all together on the night of Pesach. And you'll, you'll have that in your hand. Um, at, um, at, at this point, we've gone through the the early steps of the, or the beginning steps of the Seder, we've said, we've said through the, uh, we've spoken through the Haggadah, we've eaten the matzah, we've eaten the mar, and now we're at the meal. The meal is essentially like a regular Shabbat meal, a festive meal. Some people, um, a lot of people have the custom to eat, um, eat, to eat the egg from the Seder plate at that point. Um, and uh, we, we enjoy a regular Shabbat meal, depending on your customs. You may have your matzah ball soup now, uh, you may have fish, you may have meat, you may have all of them. Um, you may have dessert too, um, but after the, so that, that is the meal. A lot of people have customs to share uh, different stories, sing different songs, um, and then when we finish the, the meal, we have the Pesach dessert. The Pesach dessert is um, matzah. So if you if you haven't had enough matzah, you might have some more matzah, um, which is the matzah that was eaten by the when we broke the middle matzah. Um, 
and uh, um, that matzah is used for the apikoma. Um, if you have kids at home that have, and you've hidden the, a lot of people have the custom to hide the apikoma, um, which is that matzah. Um, at this point, you're going to have to bribe them to get it back. Um, you know, if you pay the right price, you'll get it to, yeah, they'll, they'll give it to you. Um, and, um, and at that point, you could eat the, uh, the matzah. All right. Now we're going to go to the end of the Seder. The Seder ends off with, uh, we filled the third cup. We've had the first one right in the beginning. The second one by the, uh, by the, um, when we, saw, when we told the story of, uh, of uh, the Haggadah. And now we have the third cup, uh, which, we, which is the cup that is set over the, uh, the, the Birkat Amazon after the blessing, after the, uh, the meal. Um, we also pour at this point um, an additional cup, which is the cup of Eliyahu, uh, the cup of Elio, Elijah the prophet. Um, this cup of wine is not drunk um, by, by us. It's a, it's, you can pour it back into the bottle. <laughs> Some people have the custom, they pour it right back in the bottle after the meal. We, had, we were told as kids that we leave it over till the next day, and in the morning we look at it, and we'd see if Elio and Avi came to the house and drank a little bit. You know, we, we all had uh, debates whether you know, we measured it in our mind, and we knew exactly what it was, and the next day it was lower. So we, we, we were so sure that he had come. Um, but uh, at this point, we do the, the reason why we make the cup of Elio and Avi is, uh, is uh, Elio is symbolic of the coming of Mashiach. Um, as we are celebrating the redemption of the Jewish people from Egypt, we want to celebrate that freedom. We want to celebrate um, the, the fact that we were free, but we're also celebrating the fact that hopefully we are free at this point. <clears throat> um, so we put out the cup of wine to, to be symbolic of that same concept of being um, free from, uh, from slavery and uh, Elio and Avi being there as well. Um, so I haven't checked in my grocery store in two weeks. I don't know whether the model is um, okay. in uh, grocery stores or whether it's unique. Okay, we do the after blessing, and then we drink a, the third cup of wine, um, just like the for, uh, first two. We pour the fourth cup of wine right after that. And um, over the fourth cup of wine, we say the hollow, which is said on Rosh Chodesh and other times of the year. Um, we say various... Uh, um, various uh, pr uh, s uh, songs of praise. And um, we thank Hashem, we thank God for everything that he has provided us and the ability to continue that in that he will continue providing for us in the future. Um, when we finish the halal, it is customary to say Lashana Habab Yerushalayim next year in Jerusalem that, uh, you know, it is our, our hope and our wish that this will be our last uh, Pesach in in the exile and and uh, and God willing, you know, by the time next year comes around, we'll already be reunited back in Israel together with everyone. Um, some people have the custom to say Chasal Siddur Pesach, which is an additional portion um, that says we have reached the end of the Pesach ritual. Um, it is not a Chabad custom to do that um, to, because just like Simchat Torah. We, we, re, we finish the Torah, but we immediately begin reading the next portion of the Torah. Um, Pesach as well is the same thing, is that we're never completely finished. We're, we're always living in that Pesach experience. Um, and uh, we're hoping that that Pesach experience uh, stays with us. Um, so that, that concludes the, the, the order of the Seder. And just to summarize, I think the main point that, uh, that, that I would say with, the, with the, whole, the whole concept of the Seder is that the Seder is meant to be a, an experience that's relived again and again and again every year. That, we, that each year, even though we may have accomplished new levels in our personal growth and new levels in, um, in spirituality and new levels in whatever it may be, every year Pesach comes around and it's an opportunity to say, where were we? Where were we enslaved this past year? Where are we free this time? Where are we going to be free this coming year? And, and I find it very ironic and beautiful in a certain sense that Pesach is coming at this time of, um, of, uh, of quarantine, at this time of being um, social distancing and staying alone, is because it gives us that opportunity 
to, to really take a look at ourselves. We don't have other people that we're showing to. We don't have other places that we're representing ourselves to, but we're just being ourselves. And by being ourselves at this time, we're able to celebrate and, and to appreciate um, you know, where we were enslaved and where we are becoming free, uh, free to as well. So I wish everyone um, the opportunity to be free from their, the things that enslave them and to appreciate the freedom of where they're headed um, and to have a Chag Sameach. And if you have questions, I am open. You have to unmute yourself if you have any questions. John, you're unmuted already. Unmuted? You're not muted. Go ahead. Not, I, I would like your phone number to ask some technical questions tomorrow. Sure. Uh, my number is 917 yes. 602 yes. 5432. 5432. Okay. Well, thank you for doing this. Uh, as I said, I have different types of questions. So I'll call you uh, directly. Please do. Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to leave the uh, leave it. So I, I do right. what? Take you know, care. How do I get out of this? Just turn off the. Just close it. How do I close it? I don't know how to kick you out. Let's see if I can cop stop you. I don't know how to close things. Wait a minute. Here maybe. No. I'm moving you. Did that work? No. No, but I just got a bigger picture of your, uh, <laughs> your of your uh, passages. Just, <laughs> just oh, here you are up here someplace. I'm not very good with. All right. While John signs out, here, here's here. one that says, "Leave the meeting." Okay. All right. On to, your, on to your next victim. <laughs> I'll just turn this off. Right. He doesn't realize. He doesn't realize. Oops. All righty. Anybody else? Fabian, it looks like you have a question. You have to unmute. Um, Rabbi Ezi. Yes, go ahead. Um, do you see any correlation between Passover and the coronavirus? The, the, the correlation I see between the two is what I what I mentioned, is that that the that the virus, <clears throat> the same way the virus is forcing us to to look inward and to not be able to go wherever we want and do whatever we want and it's forcing us to stop. I see the the, the concept that Pesach is the same concept. It stops us and forces us to look at our past and look at where we're headed. Um, so in that way, I see a, a, um, a correlation. Interesting. So I have a question, uh, Izzy. Yeah. When was the first Passover dinner? When was the first Passover? In Egypt. So the first Passover was in Egypt, but they didn't eat matzah when they were in Egypt. The matzah they was eaten after they left Egypt. So, so it's interesting. They, the, the mitzvah of matzah, came afterwards. They ate matzah in Egypt as well. Um, it, sa it says that, they, they, that the, the matzah was eaten, uh, matzah and moror, they, they had to eat as, uh, it says that in the, in the Chumash. But, um, but, the, uh, but the, the actual mitzvah of matzah came as a result of the Jewish, le Jewish people leaving Egypt and, and the matzah not rising. But the first, uh, the first Passover dinner is in Egypt the, before they just leave Egypt. Is that correct? Correct. It was the night. Um, it was the night before they left Egypt, um, <clears throat> um, while they were still there. Yeah. Did they eat bread? They, uh, they, uh, prob they probably did. They okay. probably did. Um, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> One second. Um, Something just happened here on my computer. Um, the, it's interesting. There, about a month after Pesach, um, there's what's called the um, Pesach, Sheni. Uh, Pesach Sheni. And on that Pesach, on, on the, second, the second Pesach, we have, um, how do I make this? 
something just happened with my screen. I'm trying to make it clear again. Um, here we go. Um, all right, whatever, it's just gonna be what it is. Um, on the second Pesach, we eat matzah, we eat chametz, we eat it all together. Um, which, which essentially is the way it was when the Jewish people were in Egypt. The, the whole concept of, of not eating chametz um, only began from the second Pesach. So the first Pesach, they ate whatever they wanted, really. But they, but they, they had to eat the, um, they had to eat the, the Pesach offering and, and the Mara were both part of the first Pesach Seder. Okay, that's, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Yep. All righty. Great. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. Sure. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions later, feel free to email, feel free to call. Um, if you need any, um, any matzah or any, you know, anything, just let me know and I'll be glad to. Uh, we, all do it. My, we have plenty of hagadot and uh, matzah. Um, uh, we have we all the, set. Um, matzah smura as well. Perfect. Uh, yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ezzy. Thank you, Melinda. Ezzy, I do have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, if I could, if I have to venture out to a store to try to get like matzah meal, I have a five pound box of matzah I got from Costco a month ago, but I'm trying to decide like, I was going to try to see if that Lucky's up in near Los Altos has anything, but you can't really find that out online. I think I have to go in store to do that. I don't know if you've been there lately to see what kind of collection they have i have not been there i do need to go there to um to see if they have um uh potato starch because my daughter wants to bake cakes um so okay. if i do see i will let you know you can also call them um yeah. they're, they're, they're um and uh, they can let you know but um but uh i'll let you know if i if i see because the issue is you can do an online order but that kind of stuff is i don't think is going to show up as, since it's only in that store, and I think the online order is more across the board of all Lucky. Right. right. So, I don't know. But, okay. Was but wondering I, if you went in yet. I, I, I will be going probably tomorrow. Um, okay. So I will let you know if I, if I see any. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, it's so yeah, yeah. Hi.